Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, elite uh, panel uh, uh, on uh, the, the telemedicine and its uh, impact on the healthcare processes and the healthcare delivery in India over the last uh, couple of months. And how is it going to shape and how is it going to pan out over the next uh, couple of years uh, uh, from a provider perspective uh, very specifically my name is girish kulkarni and i'm going to be the moderator for this panel today uh, i'm basically a health it cio worked with uh, multiple uh, uh, healthcare providers across the country i am also the chairperson for the board of trustees for chime in india i am also the joint secretary for the cio club as a part of the governing body and i'm based out of bangalore uh, currently working with uh, uh, multiple initiatives uh, from a hospital provider's perspective, working with uh, a few startups in terms of uh, uh, mentoring them uh, in their uh, businesses. And uh, yeah, whenever I have time, uh, get to catch up with uh, the Elite company like uh, my co-panelists to uh, get their views, get their thoughts, uh, and, and also to um, share experiences uh, of uh, how and what they have been uh, doing in their businesses. Uh, this is a quick brief about myself. Uh, may I request uh, uh, my uh, co-panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Vivek Sahi, uh, Mr. Bharat Gera, and uh, Mr. Girish Kopar to quickly introduce themselves to the audience, and then uh, let's get going on this. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, uh, Girish. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Vivek Sahi. I am a clinician by uh, profession and training. I also possess a master's degree in uh, hospital management. Uh, I have been working in uh, healthcare IT for the last uh, 14 plus years now. And uh, I've done various projects uh, across various different continents, um, spanning the length and breadth of uh, healthcare uh, uh, linked to information technology uh, at the moment uh, i currently um, also work with startups i'm currently working with one particular startup at this point of time and uh, i also am the uh, on the board of hims india uh, and i'm leading the hims india uh, telemedicine uh, committee uh, thank you and over to you uh, Bharat. Thanks, Dr. Vivek. Uh, Bharat Gera, uh, my last assignment was as the uh, channel manager IT at St. John's Medical College. Uh, and uh, earlier to that, I've been in healthcare um, for two decades, uh, been working with several hospitals. I uh, also spent about a decade working in the United States with uh, various companies that related to healthcare. Um, now, in the last year, I've been focusing on how to work together with the healthcare ecosystem. I've been working in different capacities as a volunteer with the uh, DH India, as well as with Telemedicine Society of India and the Step One project. Uh, during the COVID times, I've been spending a lot of time as a volunteer. It's been a great experience. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. One is thanks uh, Anuj and team for this opportunity. Uh, myself, Girish Kopar, uh, having uh, experience of more than a decade in this uh, healthcare IT. Currently, I have the IT for work hard hospital. Also, I am on the board of Chime India and I'm uh, a committee member and uh, look forward to it. Fantastic. Um, um my my pleasure to uh, interact with each one of you and and to welcome each one of you onto this uh, uh, elite panel um, quick uh, uh, start to this um, we have uh, uh, had uh, uh, a major set of changes which have happened and uh, a lot of uh, initiatives uh, which otherwise would have uh, taken its own time to to get done have been hazed through and and we've now seen that so the first step was uh, the the opening of the the telemedicine uh, practices uh, which was done by the government of india ministry of health and family welfare on the 25th of march and that really really opened uh, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, opportunity and each one of us have been uh, in various capacities associated with this movement the the other uh, major step which we've taken uh, a couple of days back is when uh, the Honorable Prime Minister has uh, announced the, the National Digital Health uh, 
policy and and uh, that's going to be a definite game changer in my opinion however today we would focus primarily on the telemedicine uh, part of it and and uh, speak about it for the benefit of all our audience uh, and and uh, our delegates uh, on these uh, sessions and and we're going to be uh, uh, very very particular about uh, trying to be within the framework of of telemedicine uh, let's not uh, dwell too much uh, as as a group outside that uh, is, is something which i would request though uh, each one of you would uh, have been associated with the the other set of programs and policies which the government has uh, initiated right now for to begin with uh, this is uh, one question i would uh, want to start with uh, each one of you uh, we could take the lead and then uh, go in a sequence uh, here and uh, um, my question to you all is um, the pandemic uh, actually opened the Pandora's box uh, and opened uh, a lot of opportunities. Uh, some people say it's the good, the bad, and the ugly, which has happened uh, to uh, healthcare industry and to healthcare providers, not just in India, but, but globally. So uh, in, in this situation, how do you each one of you see the evolution of uh, digital health um, which was probably about four or five years old in the healthcare businesses actually leapfrogging and then moving in a very very fast pace over the next one two and three years right Dr. sahi okay so uh, thanks girish a very interesting uh, question that you've uh, uh, put across um it's interesting to note um you know that, that you've said um, um you know the pandemic has opened up pandora's box yes of course it has um however i uh, if i look back in time uh, and all, and if we look back at uh, uh, digital healthcare in general okay uh, i would say that it has been around uh, for quite some time um it's not something that is two or three years old uh, it's it, you know it, it it has been there for uh, I would say at least uh, for the last 16 17 years if not more in India uh, at this point uh, of course it started off with um, you know digitization of the billing piece for healthcare providers uh, then went on to registration and then supply chain uh, and so on and so forth for providers and in hospitals um, so if we are saying that um, you know uh, COVID has hastened it uh, I would not say in it, it has hastened it in its entirety. Uh, I would say certain aspects um, of digital health have, you know, um, uh, have fast tracked. Let me put it that way. Uh, ever since the pandemic opened, uh, if we now talk specifically about telemedicine as an example, uh, telemedicine again, uh, as uh, all of you are aware, has been around for quite a long time. Um, I can cite inst instances of telemedicine since that have been happening since the 80s, maybe not in India, but in other countries. Uh, but if we talk about India, uh, it's been around for quite some time. There have been people practicing it in some form or the other. Uh, and uh, it had been a very, very, very fragmented uh, practice um, in the past. With the, with the commencement of the pandemic and everything that it has brought to it and the conditions um, uh, with regards to social distancing and you know protection, um, it is something that the providers have realized uh, that uh, it's more of a necessity than something that they want to do, and they had no choice but to um, accept it and transform to it and start using it, um, and that is what has led to um, uh, you know uh, depending upon which reports you read. Um, across the globe in the last six months, teleconsults have gone up by five to six hundred percent, which is phenomenal. Um, and, um, you know, although it's not a nice thing to say, but um, uh, those of us who are working in, in the telemedicine space and even in the digital health space um, have to give credit to the virus. You know, if, if humans don't want to, uh, adapt to change, then they'll be forced to adapt to it. And that's exactly what the virus has done for us. Right. So so where do you see uh, us heading over the next, uh, let's say, one or two years uh, on, the, on the digital space? 
um i uh, i i i think it's uh, only a matter of time uh, when we catch up with our counterparts in the west um with uh, um you know uh, with the prime minister on the 15th of august announcing um you know the national digital initiative um that means that the government is very very serious about uh, doing this now uh, as opposed to you know just talk now they they really want to do something um you know having a unique id uh, for each uh, indian citizen healthcare uh, you know id for each citizen in this country uh, is is going to be a a, a huge task uh, however we have seen in the past uh, the governments have managed to do uh, aadhar uh, and, the, and and according to me in my opinion i think they've done a pretty decent job about it so i think uh, if they've already proved once that they can do it with something like aadhar uh, i'm sure Uh, that they can do it uh, with a uh, unique uh, giving a unique health id to all its citizens uh, in india um over and above that um uh, what it uh, what telehealth has also done is it's uh, opened up other areas where uh, you know government and government agencies have been um, dragging their feet uh, one example i would like to say is e prescribing okay um the the commencement of that is through the implementation of the telemedicine guidelines by the government which we will come uh, come more into more detail discuss in more detail uh, during this discussion uh, but it has opened up other avenues where now the government has realized that they need to uh, come out with uh, frameworks policies and guidelines and regulations uh, to push this forward if if they want to achieve this so i see a lot of good things happening in the next 2 uh, to 3 years where healthcare digitization is concerned for health thanks thanks dr vivek uh, uh, girish uh, your opinion on this yeah uh, let me come from the provider point of view uh, as you rightly mentioned uh, this has triggered the uh, pandora's box now let us see from the provider's point of view what has changed after this uh, uh, pandemic one is how have the hospital got impacted the first point is uh, loss of revenue because there is no footfalls for opd and the patient engagement or the patient connect is missing because the patients who had had taken consultations undergone surgeries want to connect to the hospitals connect to the doctor that is not happening and as uh, dr vivek was mentioning telemedicine was always there around but it was a good feature to have so if it was more of a matter of choice for the hospital so if it is a choice obviously people will take the easier route by not adopting it so that was what was uh, previous to that now who is the savior so because there are no opd footfalls then uh, the management the hospital has to rely on something and that is where technology has come as a savior it can be as crude as using a simple uh, zoom meeting for your teleconsult basically the whole objective is to have customer engagement to keep the customer engaged to acquire new customers and do uh, uh, continuously educate so this has changed a lot of things and now this not only has changed in the b2b segments so in the hospitals because if you even go to your local gp at the beginning of the pandemic he would say uh, he would send you a link on zoom and said okay you make a payment here and then we can do a consultation so this has not only changed at a b2b level but the technology adoption is now by force i would say it would be the new normal and one more thing i would like to clarify which people get confused is tele consultation and telemedicine tele so uh, tele consultation is the first step towards telemedicine where you start engaging the patient with a, a tele call a video call then go to your uh, iot devices you connect and then move on to tele consultation because telemedicine requires a lot of investment whereas tele consultation which is the first step it starts with minimum investment and the other thing what has happened is a lot of starters ha startups have mushroomed and they are willing to uh, cater you as you want which was not there so you can even dictate the startups who are okay you can demand from the startups so so this is what is the current scenario post pandemic as rightly said this triggered the pandora's box that would i would start this talk thanks uh, girish for your thoughts uh, but bharat uh, before i uh, move to you uh, specifically around uh, this uh, point uh, uh, see uh, having heard the arguments both uh, dr vivek and girish uh, it is imperative 
we also have to think and worry about the standards and the protocols right standards could be in terms of definition of your processes uh, definition of how uh, you're going to build your technology stack how are you going to implement and how are you going to deliver services right so what's your take on on the standards and how do you see the standards actually evolving and making this happen happen easily seamlessly and uh, i would say uh, available to every single citizen through every single provider right so let me start from the beginning of the uh, covid uh, response so the first response uh, for covid uh, came from an organization called step one uh, and what uh, was essential in this context was the entire uh, triaging at scale uh, you know we, we had a lot of calls coming in uh, you know more than 20,000 calls a day coming in which the covid uh, you know, control center in Karnataka was just not able to handle. And uh, there, were, there was a deluge of calls, uh, you know, people worried about their health. And the response of uh, teleconsultation, as uh, Girish uh, rightly put across, was that you uh, do an immediate consultation on the phone using a simple IVR service. Uh, while I was doing this triage with the step one team and uh, looking at the data that was coming in, it was be becoming apparent that uh, this, you know, if there were about 5,000 doctors on the platform uh, handling the calls, and there were inconsistencies amongst uh, the doctors. Each, call, each doctor seemed to take the call in their own way in terms of triaging, uh, although there was a well defined methodology by SCMR, uh, but there were differences in the way each doctor went about taking the call. Um, you know, while we were doing that project, uh, the telemedicine practice guidelines were issued. That made it much clearer uh, in terms of March 25th, the guidelines were issued. And then it was a little bit you know, clearer, at least at a very principal level, what are the basics that need to be placed in place for a teleconsultation to take place? Uh, that you need to disclose the name of the doctor who's consulting, you need to disclose the patient's name, you need to make sure that there are some privacy, uh, you know, uh, safeguards in place, uh, security in safe, safe data is not being taken away. Uh, a lot of other interaction capabilities, what can you do during the consultation, which drugs you can prescribe, what kind of uh, consultations you can do and you cannot do. The telemedicine practice guidelines brought that out in March 25th. Now, at that time, I was working uh, as a volunteer with the Telemedicine Society of India, and they came up with a wonderful response, and they said, we're going to go out there and uh, train all the doctors on how to use these guidelines because the guidelines were published but it's like a 50 page document and how do you expect every doc doctor to know how to use those guidelines so uh, they set up some really good two hour training programs which were then uh, propagated across the country and that gave people the basics of how to do a teleconsultation but again there were a lot of calls uh, there were people who said uh, can I can I do chemotherapy at home? There, there were people saying, uh, you know, can I uh, do a consultation for a patient who's abroad? And still, there was a lot of uh, lack of clarity in terms of what could be done and what could not be done because the practice guidelines gave the principles of uh, teleconsultation or telemedicine, but did not lay down very specific uh, terms and conditions that the uh, protocols that need to be followed at this point uh, we started a project from dh india where we said we will look at because it largely boils down if you can really look at it a lot of the protocol implementation or the privacy implementation is dependent on the platforms you use and we said let us look at these platforms and see whether they conform to the standards that need to be achieved for a telemedicine provider so let's say you are a hospital or a doctor and you're providing telemedicine. Uh, what is the difference between you doing it on a WhatsApp call versus doing it on a platform which engages and gets the consent for you? Uh, so we, we then looked at these platforms and what we did was we evaluated them uh, on against the standards set in the telemedicine practice guidelines. And we also evaluated them on the um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, privacy and the security and the conformance to interoperability. Now, all these things definitely play a role in ensuring a standard uh, technology interoperability, technology consent frameworks, all this play a big role. And as we've seen over the last, uh, you know, six, eight weeks, India has made rapid progress in putting in place a digital public health infrastructure, um, which 
promises to solve these problems very, very elegantly. And uh, we've just started on that journey uh, about your question of how these standards need to be further uh, amplified and further elaborated. I think you're right. Uh, wherever telemedicine has been put in place, um, it, there, there has been a certain drop in the clinical outcomes uh, because the, 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 the doctor is not used to it. The patient is not used to it. It's, it's, it's a convenience thing, but it does not necessarily a better way to get a you know, good health outcome. Uh, so how to do that requires a way a way of designing protocols. And I understand that uh, there are organizations, including NABH and uh, another organization uh, associated with Telemedicine Society of India, which are working on this area. So a lot of promise ahead, a lot of difficulties which need to be addressed, which require the, uh, you know, putting down the stra standards and protocols in place. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Uh, fantastic and very insightful, Bharat. Uh, I would want to follow up with a very quick question uh, on uh, your uh, opinion on this, which is uh, what do you think are the, the security challenges uh, which uh, will be something which is associated with an initiative like this? OK, so uh, I would say security is two parts, right? One is the privacy part and the other is the security of data part, right? Um, now, if you were to look at privacy, it is like largely about the individual's privacy, and I would say even the doctor's privacy while doing anything digital, there's always a fear that you know you will lose your privacy. Um, that is a separate thing. Uh, that requires a consent framework, which I believe is being addressed. But another aspect which you rightly pointed out, for which I not seen much being done so far, uh, you might be more aware as you're to, you know, interacting with the digital council. Um, but what I've noticed is that it's it's literally a Pandora's box there because the IoT devices that we're going to use for remote patient monitoring uh, are fraught with a lot of dangers. Um, these these devices were not never designed to be used for a, a legitimate legal process. It was they were meant to be convenience devices for self care. Now, suddenly we've got them uh, on uh, platform. Bharat, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, Bharat. So yeah. when you say dangerous, uh, are you here referring to vulnerabilities which can be exposed or yes. which are exposed? Yes, okay. uh, vulnerability which are exposed. So one is, they, uh, you know, if you use one of these, uh, if they don't have uh, you know, pro proper access controls, it literally means the device that you're connecting to can be viewed by anybody else who can hack into your device. Now, depending on the importance of the person, they could use that hacking for very, very nasty purposes. Uh, so that is a big danger. Uh, there could be, uh, you know, showstopper kind of denial of service attacks at a very large scale if you were to deploy these uh, IoT devices uh, for a large population. I think we're not prepared uh, in India, definitely. I've uh, come across a few Israeli companies who have been working on the internet of medical things and the security involved in those areas. But in India, we have to put those safeguards in place. Otherwise, we are uh, risking a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things by opening up these devices that have not been tested from a security point of view, especially for healthcare providers. They can, they can literally be used to hack into their entire networks. So we have to be very careful. And there could be some bad players, nasty players in this whole game. As we've seen, there are geopolitics involved. So we have to be very, very careful about how we put in these, uh, whether it's a video conferencing platform or an IoT, uh, you know, IoT device, uh, we have to be very sure that these devices and these uh, video conferencing platforms are um, tested for the security protocols. Thank you. Thanks, Barak. Uh, moving on, uh, we probably uh, uh, there, I see some uh, questions from the audience, but uh, uh, I think we would look at uh, the audience questions as, uh, once uh, we're through with our conversation, and we would pick, uh, uh, if not uh, all of them, at least uh, definitely some of those important ones, and then uh, get each one of you to address that. Uh, I now uh, move back to uh, Dr. Vivek. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, telemedicine, which is uh, virtual care has uh, opened up innumerable number of uh, opportunities. Uh, where do you think are the newer opportunities 
which have been already explored where people are working on it and in your opinion where do you think the opportunities still lie and exist which needs to be opened up harnessed and utilized okay um interesting question a very pertinent question in fact um uh, if we look at um you know the journey of telemedicine um okay uh, I would say it, it has its roots in uh, specialties, as one example, when it started in its early days. It had its roots in specialties, let's say, for example, uh, psychiatry, where um, a lot of um, a lot of consults require um, counselling. Okay. Uh, yes, the the challenge in those days used to be uh, prescribing if it was required, uh, but otherwise, um, you know. Uh, psychiatrists could um, consult with their patients uh, using a simple webcam uh, and a microphone. Uh, obviously, um, uh, uh, in those days, there were no security uh, standards and uh, nobody thought about those uh, compliances, uh, but it, it was still happening. Today, if you, uh, if you look at it, uh, it has opened up a, a huge uh, number of opportunities uh, across the, the different, um, you know, uh, areas of patient care, okay? Uh, and I won't just restrict it to patient care and also uh, uh, would like to include wellness because that's in the definition of uh, healthcare as per the WHO. Um, so if we look at, if, if we take it from the beginning um, and start with, let's say, wellness, um, if, if you look at um, a, a lot of uh, fitness uh, companies, um, have started whether it's uh, Fitbit or whether it's Garmin. Um, they they started off with their uh, uh, you know watches and devices that measure basic things. From a hardcore clinical perspective, um, in my opinion, I do not see any value uh, in that. Uh, but from a wellness perspective, it holds value uh, to a certain extent. Uh, and um, what they have done is is that over and above that. Uh, through the use of um, mobile applications, uh, they have um, improved upon the wellness aspect uh, uh, for that in terms of telehealth. Um, the second thing I, I would like to come to is preventive care, um, uh, where it is used in, uh, and when I talk about preventive care, um, I uh, include uh, care that, or, or, or prevention of care, as well as uh, patients who are suffering from uh, what I would say is chronic uh, diseases, uh, the, the usual suspects being uh, diabetes, hypertension. Um, and uh, nowadays, there are lots of um, applications as well as IoT devices uh, that cater to home monitoring. So, for example, uh, glucometers, uh, for example, um, you know, blood pressure monitoring instruments. OK. Uh, technology being technology, um, of course, there is um, a degree of plus minus uh, in terms of the accuracy of the readings. But I think with technology, uh, we will be able to plug that gap over a period of time to make them as accurate as the good old, let's say, uh, dipsticks that were used for glucose monitoring or the good old uh, mercury sphygmanometers that were also used. Um, that's just a matter of time as technology itself uh, you know, progresses. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we come to uh, healthcare provision itself, uh, which I would say uh, I divide into two areas. One is of primary healthcare, uh, which is at the primary care level, and the second is at the uh, specialist or the tertiary healthcare uh, at that level. Um, wherein, uh, when we talk about primary care, we talk about your basic access to healthcare. Um, so it could be uh, at a rural level. Um, wherein uh, you know you provide basic health care for people and patients or it could be various different specialties that have start which have been around uh, i mentioned one telepsychiatry there are lots of others uh, for example i'm involved in teleradiology at the moment uh, there are others telecardiology teledermatology um, and uh, and again with the increase in technology uh, it is just um, it is just a matter of time when this will start expanding to other specialties as well. Uh, I will say this: uh, it will take a long, a little longer for specialties such as let's say uh, surgical specialties, where 
uh, you can do part teleconsult, but then if the patient has to come in for a procedure, uh, then there is no choice but to call them in and do it manually. Uh, but then again, having said that, I think it's just a matter of time where robotics uh, will, uh, you know, take over. It's already started. Um, uh, and the good thing about that is, is that um, it will help technology in that sphere will help in improving patient outcomes, uh, improving patient safety and reducing, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, patient accidents or uh, incidences um, that could possibly happen because of human uh, error. Um, but having said all of this, I think um, the guidelines that the government came out with recently uh, in telemedicine um, have um, have really it's really been an excellent start because um, in my personal experience, when I've talked to uh, clinicians and friends and colleagues um, in, in the clinical fraternity, um, you know, they uh, they knew telemedicine is there, but they were not sure how to use it. They were not aware of what they could do or what they couldn't do. Uh, some doctors talked about doing consults over WhatsApp. Uh, which I said uh, from a medical legal perspective is uh, not safe, um, but uh, they were still doing it. Okay, so I think uh, that with the uh, with with the uh, coming out of the guidelines, uh, it, it has really defined uh, the parameters in which clinicians can practice and uh, also uh, well they call them registered medical practitioners or RMPs as per the guidelines uh, and healthcare givers and healthcare providers. Uh, in addition to that, I, I think another good thing uh, uh, that it has opened up in terms of virtual care is, is that uh, over the last several years, a lot of state governments have been toying with the idea of implementing telemedicine, but uh, they they were not sure how. Now, with the uh, with the uh, one or two states have done it. Uh, one example is UP. They started. They have implemented telemedicine uh, on a large scale uh, before the guidelines were released. But now I think this gives an impetus to other states to, you know, now take it, uh, take the bull by the horns uh, because they have got guidelines and they've got a better understanding uh, to actually go forward and implement it in their respective states. You know, so it's given state governments a lot of clarity. Uh, the other thing uh, I appreciate about uh, virtual care is, uh, is that it has now partially solved an age old problem that has been dogging uh, healthcare provision which is access to care, you know, uh, with the advent of, uh, you know, complete telemedicine solutions, which include uh, uh, not just uh, the video conferencing, but also the EMR or the electronic medical record aspect, uh, as well as the uh, IOT or the information of uh, technology devices, uh, uh, devices. Uh, this has now opened a new whole area for provision of uh, healthcare nearer to the patients and has partially, I won't say fully, but has partially solved the uh, access to healthcare issue, uh, which has been uh, a problem for, you know, uh, providers in the past. Um, another uh, good thing that virtual care has done uh, in terms of the implementation of the guidelines is it has also now clarified to uh, clinicians and RMPs what tools they can use. Okay, uh, as I just stated, a lot of doctors prior to the guidelines being implemented on virtual care have been using WhatsApp. Uh, not a good thing to use. Uh, there are a lot of uh, doctor groups out there that share uh, radiology images and lab reports on WhatsApp. Uh, again, WhatsApp may say that they're encrypted end to end, uh, but then let's be honest, who owns WhatsApp? It's owned by Facebook and they have access to all the data. OK, we do not know what they do in the background, but after seeing what has happened in the past with Cambridge Analytica, for example, um, I, I have been telling uh, my friends and colleagues, clinic, clinicians to avoid it. Uh, but because of convenience and because the patients want it, uh, they are still using it. But it is also, you know, the guidelines have also provided that, look, there are uh, other, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, tools out there apart from WhatsApp. Uh, that can be used. Um, so, for for example, uh, if we look at Zoom again, uh, that also has come into question in the past. Um, but uh, they, for example, for the US, uh, they have got um, uh, uh, HIPAA um, 
certified uh, servers for their video conferencing, specifically for healthcare providers. You know, so um, uh, I think that uh, you know all these things put together, uh, the telemedicine guidelines, what we have today, uh, may not be perfect, uh, but at least it's an excellent start, and it gives uh, some idea and some guideline, you know, uh, on on the path that. Uh, you know, uh, healthcare providers, uh, whether they're private or uh, government, uh, can take uh, to start implementing uh, telemedicine services and virtual care uh, in a big way. Thanks, uh, Doctor. Uh, Girish, I know you've been waiting to go, but then I have one quick question to Dr. Vivek, and then I come back to you, and then we, after sure. that, go to the, the audience questions. So, uh, Dr. Vivek, um, quick question to you. Um, all these uh, newer things which are happening. What's your take when it comes to, let's say, um, uh, tele ER or tele triage uh, services? Okay. Um, again, um, a very important area. Uh, I would say that's a, that's a, that's quite a critical area. Um, again, um, what it boils down to is is um, the patient uh, being patient centric. Uh, at the end of the day, um, if you um, uh, if we look at the announcement made by the prime minister on the 15th of August, uh, the aim is to create uh, ultimately it's not just about have every uh, citizen in India having a unique patient ID. Uh, it also uh, goes the, the, to the next uh, level of creating a longitudinal uh, medical record for each citizen in the country. OK, now, in order to achieve that, um, you need we, what is need to be ensured is is that um, for the completion of the record for continuum of care and as what Bharat mentioned earlier the outcomes of care we need to what needs to be ensured is is that we have the uh, data from all the different sources okay today uh, they may be going to a government hospital for an outpatient uh, consultation Tomorrow, they may go to a private uh, provider for an inpatient uh, admission or a procedure. OK, now uh, the, the or or let me uh, take it another step further. Uh, there may be a case where uh, they have to uh, they, they are on um, uh, an outpatient, let's say a pregnant lady uh, who is in, in a you know, C-class town uh, and, and is using, uh, let's say, a telemedicine uh, service. OK. Um, what is critical here is is that uh, irrespective of which provider and which service the patient is availing of, uh, the patient complete patient record needs to be available to all the providers to ensure uh, uh, you know care is given to that patient and the outcomes are achieved. Uh, and for that, the golden word is which we are all very well aware of is interoperability. Okay, uh, I'd like to just cite uh, two examples here in terms of uh, that in in terms of uh, the the things that i've just said uh let's take the case i just spoke about a pregnant lady who is in a let's say in a village area uh let's say she's about uh, in you know the second trimester uh and she has developed uh, eclampsia and she also happens to be have gestational diabetes as well okay now in this case when she goes for a let's say she can't go to the uh, nearest uh, district hospital for a checkup so she goes to the tele uh, you know the telemedicine provider uh, nearest one uh, available to her um that rmp who is providing the uh, care uh, needs to make sure that they are able to uh, have the all the uh, patient her uh, details which is on one medical record as of as of that point uh, at the same time, they have to ensure that they are able to uh, link up with the three specialists. Uh, that is the OBGYN, the cardiologist, and the uh, endocrinologist. They also need to ensure, the system also needs to ensure that all these three people, the specialists sitting at their hospitals, also have the access to that same uh, EMR and data, patient data when they are uh, you know, uh, uh, consulting the patient online during a telemedicine consult. And that, uh, pulling that data from various sources is the key, which is what I said of interoperability. And that is why uh, at the time of triage, data to ensure patient care and ensure the quality of outcomes for that patient uh, is required at the time of triage. 
A second example I'd like to quickly give is with regards to trauma. Suppose there is an accident, uh, uh, you know, off the highway. The patient is taken to the nearest uh, PHC, which has a telemedicine facility. The uh, RMP at that site should be able to connect with uh, a trauma specialist or an emergency uh, unit uh, at the nearest tertiary hospital online. They should be able to connect to an orthopedic surgeon. They should be able to connect to a surgeon, uh, maybe even a spine specialist uh, at the same time, uh, because it might take time to shift the patient. The patient could be very critical. And uh, if they're able to link and if the uh, and if these specialists are able to simultaneously see what has happened to the patient, uh, then they can uh, at least stabilize the patient and the patient can then be shifted to the nearest uh, center, tertiary center for treatment. So uh, this is why I feel that uh, provision of uh, tele triage is critical at the point of care and to ensure clinical outcomes and uh, for the good clinical and desired outcomes for patient care, uh, it is uh, critical that triage is done correctly and all the data is available to all the healthcare providers, uh, uh, whether well simultaneously if possible, that would be the gold standard. Very clearly explained, Doctor. Thank you so much, uh, Girish. Uh, yep, got a couple of questions uh, for you before uh, we go to the audience. As a provider, how have you seen, and how much of these technologies have you been able to embrace and bring in? into your own uh, organization uh, with the advent of this pandemic and, and from the time, how have things changed for you as a technologist uh, for a provider and all your customers, which is your healthcare workers inside your system? What changes have happened and how have you seen this happen? Yeah, uh, the first change, which is very good from the IT perspective or the CIO perspective is IT is also seen as a revenue generator. IT was always a service provider, but this <laughs> pandemic has changed the perception now because IT has been a savior. We are able to generate business. So that is the first perspective change. IT can also bring revenue. Second is uh, from the hospital point of view. Yes, uh, because of this pandemic, we had to start somewhere. So start small, start with teleconsultation. We started with teleconsultation, video consultation. And the third thing is patients, as Dr. Vivek was mentioning, patients are also aware now uh, care can be available through technology. Right. The example which I would like to quote here is we have started this home quarantine facility where for this pandemic patients, they need not come to the hospital if they are asymptomatic. So this we have started uh, using technology where the hospital is also benefiting. We are not losing customer patients. The patients are at the comfort of their home. They are asked to have some devices like your SPO2 and they have to just read out the readings and mention it. So this engagement, patient engagement is very big thing which has really happened and that is good for the entire community. So we had to start somewhere. It will obviously evolve and stabilize at a point of time. It was always there. Technology was not tested, so it will take some time. But at least we have started. We started exploring. Yes, as uh, Dr. Bharat was also mentioning, there are privacy challenges, there are security challenges. But hopefully, uh, that will be taken over. Because one more thing is from the patient's perspective. Now, patients are also comfortable to have a video consult, which they were not. Initially, patients were very rigid to come and see doctor in person. They wanted a physical uh consultation now with this pandemic with the fear of travel that is one and second is there are a lot of patients who are not mobile for them this is really become a boom so the next next logical step from the provider point of view is uh, leverage on this and uh, and uh, something called home care where patients have started demanding and now that they know that care can be given through technology they can always start home care facilities where uh, at the comfort of their home there will be a consultation, the doctor on the other side. And secondly, we do have hospitals in tier two cities. We can always start a satellite clinics where the rural population can be tapped. So these are the initiatives what we are uh, 
planning this in the pipeline. So uh, Girish, uh, uh, as a follow up to your uh, response, uh, uh, you know, what is it that you would want to share as your thoughts, your advice uh, to the, the the healthcare providers in India, maybe the small and medium and the medium sized uh, health providers in India as to what their telemedicine strategy should be and what should be the sort of timelines that they should give to themselves to make this happen and then then show outcomes for them telemedicine is again a journey so uh, as i mentioned in my first comment you need to start with a teleconsultation and a video consultation because telemedicine was there there's a cost associated with it so if you're talking about mid-size hospitals with the current uh, pandemic revenues are a bit of a problem so you may not have that much of a capex to start with telemedicine you can't leapfrog directly from zero to telemedicine what i would suggest is you start with teleconsultation have your processes in place start engaging the customers once you have engaged the customers there are a lot of tools like crms and all available where you can know who are your customers then once your processes are uh, are in place have a core committee which comprises of your operations your clinicians who will form a team first buy in the stakeholders your hospital stakeholders then start uh, uh, having devices integrated one by one and then go to this thing once that is stabilized have a tele uh, maybe a tele radiology or a tele icu depends on what your strength is depending what your hospital is uh, is your main uh, specialty business model so based on that you have a choice because telemedicine again it's a very broad term in telemedicine you can have a tele uh, radiology tele icu tele cardiology so you can depend on that and that is one and secondly uh, also you can have a primary health center setup because once you have the process in states, if you have hospitals in say tier two, tier three cities, there is a lot of rural population who are uh, find it difficult to travel, or uh, they have some limitations. They are not mobile. They are bedridden. So for all these, you can tap these uh, patients. You know? So this would be, and look at a time frame of say say six months to progress from your teleconsult to your telemedicine that would be the time frame you know so in that uh, you also identify a good partner because all for all this you need a good partner who can design the application based on needs because in this particular industry having a good partner is difficult because every hospital has a different process so one partner if he has a flavor he will have a vanilla flavor so how do you have that uh, uh application customized to your processes that is very important so having a right partner who can uh, have on a size model in this, uh, this thing would be a good option uh, according to me. thanks girish uh, thanks uh, pretty insightful uh, i think we will uh, possibly look at a couple of audience questions i'm not too sure how many are there just just give me a minute I'm opening my window and uh, yeah, there are about four or five, but uh, let me just probably pick up a few uh, very relevant uh, ones uh, for uh, our discussion. Just just a second. Uh, please be on line. I'm just trying to run through, read through all the questions and yep. I mean, uh, any one of you or all of you can uh, give me your take on this but uh, one of the question is uh, sir what is what is i'm i'm reading it uh, quote and unquote so uh, what are the business models of telehealth platforms uh, is it digital only is it digital first or do you suggest a hybrid model some of the thoughts already come from uh, girish uh, in his previous uh, statement but then uh, I would want uh, others also to take uh, their, uh, I mean, provide their opinion on this, and Girish can also do it. Yours, gentlemen. 
Yeah, I'll take this one. Uh, so um, the way I see it is that, you know, we're talking about telemedicine as a catch-all term, but everybody sees the elephant differently depending on where they are, you know, which part they're holding, uh, which, <laughs> which really means that there are going to be different interpretations of how to go about it. And um, the uh, entire ecosystem is going to be disrupted. Now, um, who's going to be able to get more traction out of this change? Is it going to be people who come in, like you said, with a digital only model? I mean, they don't have any hospital, they don't have any facilities, they just you know, bring like Uber drivers, they bring the uh, doctors on board. And then you have people who are doing digital first, but they have uh, you know, facilities or the ability to provide a home care service. Uh, they have the physical part as well. And then lastly, you have the ones who have largely physical services and the capabilities, but they also enable themselves to become digital. Now, which of these business models will get more uh, benefit out of this change? Uh, the first look, it seems like the digital only guys will benefit because they will acquire a lot of customers and they will be able to you know, capture uh, attention. And their abilities to do this will be higher in terms of you know the experience they provide. But you know, healthcare is largely about uh, the physical service at the end of the day, because even after a triage is done or a consultation is done, if there's a follow-up investigation or there's a follow-up consultation, you will still have to go to a physical facility. So my take is that there will be a new class of providers, and I don't think they will be purely physical and they'll not be purely digital either. So I would bet on the guys who are digital first and back it up with a solid physical uh, service at home. Thanks, but I would like to add to this. Uh, you are right. It has to be a hybrid model. See, because what we were thinking is like for consultation, when the uh, obviously when the patient walks into the hospital, there is a follow-up consultation. So we were planning to have this follow-up consultation where already a rapport has been established with the doctor and the follow-up consultation, the doctor must have advised some tests or some investigation and come up with a report. So the follow-up consultation would be an ideal hybrid model where for the first consultation, the doctor has seen the patient and he just has a follow-up consultation, which can be done over. So such type of a hybrid model is. Uh... Yeah, um, uh, my view is, is that uh, I agree with both uh, Girish and Bharat on this. Um, simply because uh, of the way medicine is taught and practiced you know um, um ever ever since you know practice of medicine has started it, it has always been um you know a physical event or a physical um thing where um you know uh, a, do a doctor uh, does need to uh, evalu evaluate certain signs and symptoms uh, based on a physical uh, touch or a uh, examination Okay. Uh, however, having said that, I think um, if uh, healthcare providers are able to become uh, what I would call integrated uh, healthcare providers uh, and provide uh, whatever um, model or part of that model that can be done uh, technically uh, and then the rest be done manually, uh, I think that is what is going to uh, be a successful model going forward. Um, and I've also strongly always believed that uh, contrary to what patients think that uh, they um, the doctor is responsible for their health care. Uh, well, in my opinion, I'm sorry, they're not. Uh, the patient themselves are responsible for their wellness and health care. Um, and the doctor is only the uh, person who will uh, treat them. And uh, it is time that patients uh, started uh, taking responsibility for their wellness and health care. And it has started. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it has started, uh, which is a good thing, uh, and it's only a matter of time uh, where it will, uh, you know, continue. Thank you so much. Appreciate. Uh, two very, very last specific pointed questions. If this, when I say this as in telemedicine and the initiatives, is going to be a bubble to burst, will it still carry the same euphoria and the momentum once the pandemic gets downgraded to endemic maybe in the next couple of months or the next year what happens to all that we've spoken all that we've seen uh, happening in the last six months in terms of moving 
out virtually to where the patient is than getting the patient to come where you are. Your right. take, gentlemen. So let's look at the geographies where some amount of opening up has already happened. Uh, what the news has been filtering in is that post the pandemic, during the pandemic phase in those countries, uh, the telemedicine went up from like 2%, 3% to, you know, sub 10% to about 60%, uh, right up to 90% in some of the countries. Um, post the opening up of the healthcare facilities, they dropped down uh, considerably um, from say 90 to 60 and from 60 to 40, but they never went back to 3%. And they probably will never go back to 3% because once the doctor and the patient have tasted the success of telemedicine, like I'll just quote a personal example. I know somebody who was able to get a diagnosis of Zooster online. This person is going to continue to use it. And so is the doctor who's done the diagnosis and given the prescription because they know it worked. So similarly, they're going to be a good percentage. My bet is 15, 20% even after the pandemic will continue. Which yeah, is a big I jump from what it was. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Very but true. My perspective is uh, there will be a decline. We will not have the same percentage what we see here if, uh, for a hypothetical 60 it won't be 60 post pandemic that is very obvious but it is up to the management it should be a top down approach like okay now during this pandemic we have set this process and you need to follow this because there will be some players who are forced to adopt this technology even though they were not willing now they see array everything is back to normal we can go back we will not do so it has to be more of a top down approach where the management has to influence it because we had this long conversation of adoption of technology. Now that is taken care. It, it, it we have to hold on to it. If we don't hold on to it, then it's going to be disaster. So the management top-down approach has is very uh, vital. Um, Thanks, Girish. Okay, uh, I'd like to take three perspectives. Okay, uh, first I'll take the patient perspective. Um, even if the pandemic, um, you know, uh, starts to stabilize. Um, you know, a vaccine comes out whenever it does, a cure comes out whenever it does. Um, psychologically, the patient will feel that that fear is still in the back of their minds. So if they're given a choice that, A, would you like to come in and see the doctor and or B, would you like to have an online consult? Uh, that will be a patient's choice, which will dictate the uh, increase or decline from a patient perspective. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, second thing is from a provider perspective. Um, when patients start coming back to hospitals and things come back to normal, um, uh, I think Girish can uh, comment on this a bit better. But uh, it'll then come up. It'll then be uh, at the as he said, it's up to the management uh, what they want to do. Uh, do they find that they can save costs doing teleconsults uh, while still charging the same, um, uh, you know, uh, consultation uh, uh, fees, whether the patient comes into the uh, clinic or uh, they uh, do it online uh, is entirely up to them. So that is a that would be a management call. And secondly, will they be able to scale up or maintain that level of technology to keep supporting telemedicine and teleconsults that are uh, happening? Uh, and then the third thing I would look from a clinician's perspective, which is um, uh, I have I have friends who are GPs who have actually said, you know what? Um, please let us know where we can get the telemedicine training from because uh, we would like we would like to stick with this going forward. We would not like to go back to our clinics and we find that patients, our patients are also comfortable with this. Okay. So from a clinician's perspective, uh, again, I would say I look at it as a specialty uh, specific. Uh, maybe uh, people in certain, well, of course, where, where surgical specialties are concerned, definitely patients will have to come in. Um, you know, uh, in case of, uh, uh, you know, uh, they have to be examined by a surgeon and perhaps have to undergo a procedure. But on the other hand, if we talk about primary care as an example, uh, and maybe certain uh, specialties of uh, tertiary care, um, uh, you know, if patients are comfortable, then doctors might just say, go back and say that, okay, uh, let us continue with teleconsults if, if, if that's convenient and uh, for us and the patients. Um, in an overall perspective, I'd just like to add one thing. Uh, psychologists say that it just takes 21 days to change a habit. Uh, we are now almost four months or five months into the pandemic um, and <laughs> habits have definitely changed. 
Now, will they change back? Uh, remains to be Another seen. 21 days. <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I my my last question to each one of you. I've got a couple of uh, people who've been asking for this. Um, two, three of them have asked, where can we uh, actually find a comparative between platforms uh, which we should look at adaption uh, from a telemedicine teleconsult perspective? Now, I'm asking this question to. All of you, because I know you've been involved in, in setting up of the telemedicine registry and a lot of effort, a lot of time spent on evaluating platforms, products, classifying them. So uh, where do you think as a uh, as a, a delegate or an audience, somebody wants to start their telemedicine teleconsult journey? Uh, what is it that they need to look at and where can they get more information about uh, all the platforms and the providers there? Bharat, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So when we started the telemed registry, the objective was to do exactly what you're saying, give the healthcare providers a choice of platforms that they could use to deliver safe, secure, and comprehensive telemedicine. Uh, what we have been able to do now is at least get them uh, a, you know, a choice to go to this website and see what all is available. So you go to the website, you can see uh, under each category what are the choices of platforms. And over that, we have evaluated these platforms. Dr. Vivek and uh, Girish both have been members of these evaluation panels, where we have evaluated these platforms and scored them in the expert panel's views of where they stand in terms of compliance and standards, where they stand in terms of the experience that they give to the doctor and the patient, and the convenience of uh, flexibility of the processes. So this would be a good place to start. You can choose the category you want to look at, like tele-ICU or uh, teleconsultation or remote patient monitoring or even specialized services. These are the four categories. Under those categories, you can look at who's available and the ones that are evaluated, you can get a detailed report on it. Other than that, we also have a preliminary report which guides you on the roadmap to uh, go on the journey. And uh, starts with the telemedicine part of it, telehealth, and then uh, the virtual care. So uh, I think Girish and uh, Dr. Vivek can explain what we have been doing in the evaluation in the telemed registry. No, I think so, uh, let let the the, the 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 users go across and then uh, visit the site and then start taking information and then they can reach uh, any one of you uh, if they want right. uh, specific help in terms of guidance, how to go about uh, devise their own uh, uh, strategies uh, and and stuff like that. We could always do that. Sorry, Bharat, I had to stop this because uh, probably running out of time. I will not be able to take any uh, further audience questions at this point of time. So I'm closing that. But before we wind up, uh, <coughs> a few few of my thoughts here. Um, the first and foremost thing is uh, uh, you guys have been able to uh, articulate this in greater detail that telemedicine is not equal to teleconsult. Teleconsult is a part of the, the telemedicine ecosystem, and that's the most fundamental thing. So I don't want people to get confused about it, and that's the reason I'm I'm reiterating on this. This has come out pretty evident and, and strongly here. The second thing is uh, uh, this has actually, as I said initially, opened the Pandora's box, but then this is also solved, and as Dr. Vivek said, and age old issue of access to care. I think we've now been able to reach out a few times more number of patients than what we could have actually achieved uh, and, and then cater to, right? So that is something which is a very, very uh, important outcome of how this has actually helped uh, both the, the, the provider and most importantly, the, the patient uh, community, okay? Uh, then the next thing which I would want to say is is from an approach perspective and again um, we've seen the um, great articulation on that uh, no point in having the big bang uh, approach here take small steps take informed decisions and move towards those outcomes which you think are achievable achievable not just in terms of deploying and saying hey i've achieved this achievable from a perspective of defining the do's and don'ts for every one of the elements be it the service provider or the 
the recipient of these services you know so you have to define your do's and don'ts very clearly set your processes in place to make sure everybody understands what the borders are or the boundaries are the second thing is make sure that all the care providers are trained and enabled to deliver services as per the defined do's and don'ts which is another very very important uh, thing here then we come to the question of uh, data privacy which is a separate subject a lot of work happening around data privacy both uh, at the state and the, the central government levels uh, guys have been a privy and a party to it all of us have been knowing about it but that's a separate subject which i don't want to dwell uh, at this point of time into privacy and and security is is uh, paramount and sacrosanct cannot be compromised so we got to make sure that we, we are fully uh, testing this entire uh, platform end to end before anything is rolled out okay and and another important aspect which did come out from completing this loop is in terms of the consent framework where there is a lot to be done i i personally opine that we still have uh, uh, miles to go on this because it's it's not complete it's not comprehensive there are gaps there are issues but i'm sure as as we go along as we come across different use cases every day we are going through the process of hardening our own processes and sops to make sure that we don't hit the same uh, situation time and again right now having done all this where are we moving towards okay um, where are we moving towards is is something which clearly comes out which says uh, tech as a savior that's that's a very very powerful statement uh, girish made and 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 i completely agree with you on that uh, girish uh, no two ways about it we have had our challenges we've had our our share of uh, problems uh, in a situation where uh, revenues have shrunk shrunk to about 10 uh, maybe single digits for performing uh, hospitals and providers it has been extremely difficult to pull out additional budgets for these kind of initiatives but then with all those limitations i think as a community we have stood together stood up and said hey look i will deliver this for you and that's that's a fantastic effort from each one of you who have been doing this day in and day out for the last couple of months so so um, tech as a savior has has changed the outreach process has changed the way we've gone to our patients has changed the way we engage and interact with our patients right so that is a very very important thing uh, uh, which we need to keep in mind now what does this uh, actually mean from us uh, borrowing uh, a few lines here are we moving from uh, illness to wellness the answer is yes are we moving from uh, um, reactive to proactive care the answer is yes are we moving from preventive or oh, sorry uh, are we moving from reactive to preventive care yes we are moving towards preventive care so uh, that is something which we have seen clearly happening so what has happened is wellness proactive and preventive care are are the three solid mantras which has emerged out of this tough situation for all of us and and telemedicine has been the vehicle and the platform for us to deliver this both to our own organization and to our patients right after all this we still have to live with the great indian jugaad thanks dr vivek the whatsapp of this world the other other uh, internet messenger tools will still be in existence we really don't have a choice we have to live with them but then as much as we can we need to educate our fellow care providers that this is something which is not acceptable particularly once you have the privacy laws and all that becoming uh, 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 an act and getting enforced i don't think we can even think of doing those things what we have been doing today but then you really can't stop it right we will have to make a conscious effort to mitigate it as much as possible so so the the, the point is we have come a long way we have made tremendous strides on this uh, we have seen ourselves as as health technologists that 
the last six months of action probably is is much larger much faster than what we probably would have seen for the last one two decades we've been associated with this industry that's the, that's the way uh, that's the pace at which we've we've been able to see this change happen and this change is now going to be the constant but still the loop is not open and we have miles and miles and miles to go and i think together all of us we should be able to overcome this very soon thank you so much thank you thanks thank uh, thanks to anuj and uh, team uh, from uh, the sikso tv for uh, giving us this opportunity and then putting our thoughts in i'm sure uh, you will have uh, all your delegates and audience uh, being immensely benefited and uh, please uh, feel free to reach uh, out to any of us for any any specific doubts uh, clarifications or a discussion or a debate on this uh, subject now uh, a last disclaimer here these are all our personal opinion personal views and these are not mandated to be accepted and absorbed by anybody who's hearing us out thank you so much appreciate bye bye thank you